Okay, well, I'm not sitting at that seat right now because I'm sitting at the controls. We're missing one engineer right now, and so I'm doing double duty. We're, we're going to make it kind of a, a quick and easy one here. We're going to play the 28-minute uh, a, a, a one. You know, a lot of people don't understand how dirty governments get, how, how nasty, how, how absolutely evil they get. You know, we think of them only fighting for causes of good and things like that. But no, I mean, there's evidence that our government had to have something to do with 9-11. And, uh, you know, here's a really good story we've told you about the uh, USS Liberty being shot down or trying to be sunk by the Israelis and the Real News Network has done a really good uh, expose, if you will, on that. We're, it's a 28 minute one. Let me get this set up right here. Uh, there we are ready now. Uh, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right to that and it'll be 28 minutes later. I'll come on back and see you then. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. This month marks the 48th anniversary of the Israeli attack on the U.S. Navy spy ship, the USS Liberty. The attack took place during the Arab-Israeli War of 1967. The official story of the attack was that it was a case of mistaken identity. What we know is that the spy ship was attacked by four Israeli fighter bombers, Navy motor torpedo boats, near Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. It's officially said the attack was an error that the U.S. ship in question was thought to be an Egyptian ship. But many, including former heads of the CIA and NSA, never believed the Israeli version of the events. Surviving witnesses of the attack confirmed that this could not have been a mistake. They say that day in June 1967 was clear that the American flag was very visible on the ship. But as we know from a report that Pulitzer Prize winner John Crutzen wrote in the Baltimore Sun and the Chicago Tribune in 2007, there weren't meant to be any survivors. Crudson quotes Steve Forslund, who worked as an intelligence analyst for the Air Force. The ground control station, meaning Israeli, ordered the aircraft to attack and sink the target and ensure they left no survivors. Today, we'll speak to one of those survivors. Sergeant Bryce Lockwood joins us from Stratford, Missouri. He served 13 years in the Marine Corps as a staff sergeant and remains the only surviving Marine of the attack on the Liberty. As a Marine, he received the Silver Star for Heroism. Also joining us from Arlington, Virginia, is Ray McGovern. Ray is a former CIA analyst who was employed under seven U.S. presidents for 27 years. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. So, Bryce, start. I want to kind of jump to the end, and then we'll work our way chronologically. Um, if, if this communication that Crutzen quotes that the mission was actually to sink the boat, and so that, I, I want to assume, so there wouldn't be any witnesses to the attack. Um, why didn't they sink it? Well, I think they ran out of ammunition. I know the aircraft ran out of ammunition. And the uh, motor torpedo boats, uh, there were three of them. The standard uh, formation is a wedge formation, one in the center and two held back a little bit. Forward one fires two torpedoes and swings off. The next one fires two torpedoes and swings off. And the third one likewise. So there should have been six torpedoes fired. There were five that were fired. Only one actually struck the ship. But it struck the ship in the vital area where all of our communications personnel, intelligence personnel were working. As a matter of fact, I have a picture right here. This was taken of me the next morning. So... Uh... Still, you would think, would the planes not be able to keep bombing and sink the ship? There, there are only so many rockets and so many 40-millimeter uh, cannon shells that they could fire at us. There were over 820 large-caliber strikes on the ship, including napalm. There were two napalm bombs dropped onto us. Rockets and 40-millimeter cannon fire, which makes a pretty big hole. The ship, when those rockets struck it, it was literally like a very hot knife through butter. Just melted three-quarter inch steel on the skin of the ship. Now, if I understand correctly from what I know of the story, there was also, uh, there was some kind of blocking of SOS messages 
But finally, an SOS message does get through, or there's evidence that one did get through earlier and wasn't responded to, and we're going to get to that part of the story. But then an SOS message does go through, and then the Israelis break off their attack. Is that, all, is that correct? Uh, the Israelis were jamming our distress frequencies. That's a violation of international law. It's okay to jam tactical frequencies, normally uh, where orders are sent back and forth between ships and personnel and aircraft and so forth. That, that is okay to do that, but not international distress frequencies. That's a violation of international law. And these Israelis were jamming our distress frequencies. They had shot up all of our transmitting antennas in the first air raids. And we had one whip antenna, which was not working. A young sailor by the name of Terry Halbardier took a roll of coaxial cable and ran that back to the after part of the ship to that one whip antenna. And the radio operators had figured out that uh, when rockets were being fired from the aircraft, that they couldn't jam their distress frequencies because the, the jamming was also screwing up the flights of the rockets. So there was a, a brief period of a few seconds time when rockets were being fired at us when the jamming was not taking place. Right. And that's when the distress frequency was sent off. Before we go any further, uh, how many people were killed and wounded that day? There were 34 killed. Uh, nine were killed uh, topside in the aircraft attacks, and 25 were killed in the research compartment by the torpedo explosion. We had a total complement of 294 uh, personnel altogether. That included three civilian analysts from the uh, linguists from the uh, Na National Security Agency. Uh, us three Marines, and uh, the balance were naval personnel, uh, both intelligence personnel and those who operated the ship. There were 208 total Purple Hearts awarded out of a crew of 294. So, so just to frame this discussion a little bit, the, the, there's, the evidence seems to point to, although the official version concluded otherwise, that the Israelis knew exactly what they were doing, um, that the, we're going to get into the detail of this with Bryce and Ray, um, that the ship was clearly visible uh, and, and that you know, 34 people are killed and many more wounded. Um, and yet this goes down in history as an error with which some compensation was paid for the error. Um, but then let's deal with sort of the big question, Bryce. Uh, how, how, based on you being there that day and what you saw, why do you think this couldn't have been a mistake? We were overflown several times during the morning of June the 8th by Israeli aircraft, at least eight times on uh, 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 eight different occasions that we were overflown. And the reason they were doing that is to make sure that they knew exactly where all of our transmitting antennas were so when they attacked, they could knock us out. Now, the excuses the Israelis give, well, they didn't see a flag. Excuse me. They shot down two flags and we ran up three. The third flag that we ran up was our holiday flag. That's the largest flag you have aboard ship. They claim, well, we couldn't see a flag because of smoke. Well, there wasn't any smoke until the Israelis dropped napalm on us. Um, they, they claim that they thought that we were an Egyptian ship, the El Qasir, which is a World War I horse carrier, had not been to sea for 20 years and was waiting to be cut up for scrap. Well, there's some problems with that. Excuse also, number one, U.S. ships are painted gray with white markings. Our hallmark was GTR-5. That's your ship's license plate. GTR-5 stands for General Technical Research, the fifth ship of her class, the largest and newest ship of her class. General Technical Research means she's a non-combatant, and non-combatants are not legitimate military targets. I mentioned U.S. ships are painted gray with white markings. Egyptian ships are painted black with gray markings, and those hallmarks are in Arabic script. Big difference. And nobody from Israel can give me the excuse that they don't know the difference between English markings and Arabic script. All highway signs in Israel are marked in Arabic. Is it possible uh, that 
this is in the midst of a war. There's many, there's, uh, who knows how many pieces of information and data uh, the command has to process at the same time. Uh, if you look at Crudson's article, uh, I should have said that he wrote that for the uh, Chicago Tribune and the Baltimore Sun uh, in 2007. At the very end of the article, there's a timeline. And in that timeline, he's, he, uh, I'll read what he has here. He says, uh, the Israeli naval commander orders the commander of the torpedo boat division to attack the Liberty. This is 2.20 PM. At almost the same time, the naval operations branch orders, do not attack. It's possible the aircraft not identified correctly. The commander of the torpedo boat division says he never got any order to cease the attack, although the deputy commander says he passed the message to the commander. Um, I mean, once they really launch the attack and continue the attack, and actually, that's my uh, question. How long did this attack go on for? The attack lasted a total of 75 minutes when we were actively being shot at. So it's uh, not possible problem. over the course of that w early, early into that 75 minutes, they know what they're attacking. And maybe they know what they're attacking right from the beginning. That if, if this information that Crudson gives in the timeline is correct, there's contradictory orders coming from the Israeli command. Um, I mean, is it, I guess this is a bit of hypo uh, theorizing, but is it possible this begins as a miscommunication error, and then once they la start the attack, then they decide to sink the ship because it's better that there's no witnesses to it than, than not? If you go on YouTube and search the day Israel attacked America, there is an hour and a half long film on there and the, the actual conversations in Hebrew between ground control and the aircraft are on that film, the day Israel attacked America, in Hebrew, identifying it as an American ship. So there's no question in your mind from the very beginning they have to know it's an American ship. And based on the quote I read from in the introduction, um, actually, let me read a little more of that quote because it's, it's uh, when you hear the, the whole quote, it's rather damning. Um, so this let is. Let me just inter interject this, Paul. Yeah. Had the Israelis been shooting at the El Qasir, which they claim, the torpedoes would have totally missed. Torpedoes have to be set for a certain depth in order to strike their target in a vital place. USS Liberty was three times the tonnage of El Qasir and much uh, a larger uh, depth. Had the Israelis been shooting at El Qasir, the torpedoes that they fired would have totally missed because of the difference in draft. Well, does that explain why so many did miss? Uh, quite frankly, I think the Israeli Navy was not nearly as competent as the Israeli Air Force was. In my opinion, one of those six torpedoes never got to leave the torpedo tubes because of the Israeli Navy incompetence. All right, let me read this quote from Steve uh, Forslund. Steve Forslund is an intelligence analyst for the 544th Air Reconnaissance Technical Wing, then the highest level strategic planning office in the Air Force. And I'm quoting Crudson's piece. Quote from Forslund. The ground control station, meaning the Israeli ground control station, stated that the target was an American and for the aircraft to confirm it, Forslund recalled. The aircraft did confirm the identity of the target as American by the American flag. Quote, the ground control station ordered the aircraft to attack and sink the target and ensure they left no survivors. Forslund said he clearly recalled, quote, the obvious frustration of the controller over the inability of the pilots to sink the target quickly and completely. He kept insisting the mission had to sink the target and was frustrated with the pilot's responses that it didn't sink. Nor, Forslund said, was he the only member of his unit to have read the transcripts. Everybody saw these, Forslund, now retired after 26 years in the military. So if this is correct, the mission is to sink the boat. What did you witness there? Just take us through the events as you saw them. Uh. I was actually below decks when the attack took place. Uh, we had had a drill GQ at noon local time and had secured from that drill GQ about 1,300 hours at 1 o'clock. I went to a, a small stores aboard the ship. Uh, when I was ordered to her, I didn't have very many uniforms with me and I needed some more clothing, pieces of clothing. So I went to small stores and purchased some articles of underclothing and T-shirts. 
and it was at my bunk st stamping my name on those T-shirts for to make sure they got separated out correctly in the laundry. When the first uh, shell struck the ship, I had never been under uh, combat conditions before, but I knew immediately that we were under attack just from the sound of the shells striking the ship. So I immediately dropped what I was doing and went to my GQ station, which was in the research spaces in the bowels of the ship below the waterline. Um, I remember uh, a, a chief, um, Melvin Smith, stating, well, I guess we better start emergency destruction. That's one of the things that intelligence personnel just do not want to hear. There was so much work that went into uh, processing the intelligence, which we had, manuals for uh, decoding um, materials and language materials, uh, reels and reels and reels of magnetic tape, of combat conversations that we had recorded. We didn't want to hear that. But we got out our ditching bags and filled them. Um, I was sitting at a plotting table in the processing and reporting area when the division officer, Lieutenant Maury Bennett, stuck his head in the door and he said, Sergeant Lockwood, would you come here a moment, please? I stepped out into the passageway, which ran down the center of the ship, and um, Mr. Bennett, Lieutenant Bennett, and uh, Lieutenant Commander Dave Armstrong began a conversation with me about these ditching bags, they needed to be put up topside and pitched over the side. Uh, the whole idea was to get them in the water where uh, no other uh, country could retrieve the intelligence information that we had. Well, there's a bunch of shooting going on topside, and that's a Marine's job. So apparently I was called to get a working party together to get rid of those ditching bags. Let me ask you one question. Who did you think was attacking you at that time? Uh, the assumption was that they were uh, Arabs, United Arab Republic, or Egyptians. Uh, we had no idea that it was the Israelis. Uh, just about the time that conversation about the ditching bags ensued, there was a blinding flash. A uh, torpedo had struck. I didn't realize that it was a torpedo at the time. But uh, I was knocked to the deck. Uh, the first thought that crossed my mind was life was over with. Uh, I thought... Well, Lord, I guess this is it. I guess I'm coming home. At least Lois and the kids are taken care of. Lois is my wife. I felt something cold, and I kind of stupidly looked down, and water was coming in around my feet, and it felt cold. And I thought, oh, my God, we're in trouble. And I struggled on my feet, and I heard a sailor behind me moaning. And the water is starting to come up pretty quickly. Uh, I turned around and tried to pull the sailor loose. There was He had been uh, pinned under a, a steel bulkhead, a temporary bulkhead, which separated the spaces so the people that didn't belong in there couldn't get in there. When that torpedo struck, the explosion of it just blew that bulkhead out like a gigantic mushroom. And the, the man I didn't find out until, oh, 25 years later who it was, his name was Joe Lentini, he had been struck by a piece of shrapnel from uh, the aircraft rockets in his uh, left thigh and was sitting on the deck leading up against the ladderway that went to the next level above and trying to put a tourniquet on his wound when the torpedo struck. His left leg was propped up, and when that bulkhead struck his leg, it just made toothpicks of his leg and pinned him into that wreckage. I tried when, to get when, did you realize, when did you realize the attack was Israeli? Uh, not until the next day. Uh, I, I tried to get my hands under his armpits and pull him loose, but he was wedged in there really tightly, and I tried to holler at him. I said, come on, you got to help me. You can't do it by myself. And I'm tugging and pulling on him, and the water was up to his chin by then. I said, come on, get your legs under you and push. I can't do it by myself. Come on, push, push. And he got his right leg under him. I didn't know his left leg was smashed. He got his right leg under him and pushed just hard enough to where I could free him. But his leg was still tangled up in that wreckage. And by that time, the water was in, oh, a foot and a half of the overhead. There were some pipes up there. And I saw another unconscious sailor starting to float out the torpedo hole. I reached down and got an arm around him and held his head above water. And I said to uh, Joe Lentini, 
said, here, get a hold of these pipes up here and hold yourself up. And a, a lot of the sailors were all crowding around the ladder way to the next level above, and there was a lot of shouting and confusion going on. And as loudly as I could, I hollered, knock it off. If y'all don't settle down, none of us will get out of here alive. And I heard that Mr. Bennett was at the top of the ladder way to the next ladder above. I heard him say, this is Mr. Bennett. Open this hatch. And uh, apparently I uh, fell into unconsciousness about that time because the next thing I remember, I was down there alone with an unconscious sailor and uh, life wasn't very pretty. The hatch was sealed shut. Um, I tried to pull this unconscious sailor, didn't even know who it was, didn't find out who that was until some 30 years later. Um, tried to get him up the ladder way, dropped him. Uh, the ship was rolling and water was gushing in and out of the torpedo hole. Went back and got him, tried to get him up the ladder way, slipped and dropped him again. The, uh, the railing to the ladder way had been bent by a piece of shrapnel from the torpedo. So it was a very narrow opening. I got him above that, and the hatch was closed. I started pounding on the hatch, and the captain had sent a uh, one of the damage control people, his name was Phil Turney, sent him down there to take a look and see how badly the ship was damaged, whether or not we were going to uh, sink right away. And uh, Phil heard me pounding on the hatch and opened the hatch, and let me out along with this unconscious sailor. And, and during all this time, the attack is continuing. Yes, the aircraft were still fighting us. The torpedo boats were circling us and riddling us with heavy machine gun fire. The Israelis were using a 30 millimeter shell, which is considerably larger than our 50 millimeter shell. That is our standard machine gun for uh, torpedo boats. It's about two and a half times the size. And my understanding, there there's a, a raft leaves, a, an escape raft, and they start to strap this this raft. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, all of our uh, life rafts, uh, we had two racks with uh, a, a li inflatable life rafts on them. Those were napalm. There was nothing left of those but a few rags from the davits. Those were totally unusable. The uh, captain's launch and the uh, Liberty launch with the two boats that we had that were used for getting personnel back and forth between shore and the ship were just riddled with heavy caliber fire. They were totally useless. So in your mind, there's, is there any doubt that the mission was no survivors? No survivors. Absolutely no survivors. Okay, Ray. Uh, um, th there's, there's some evidence now we know that there was actually an earlier... SOS that did make it through, even though there was jamming, um, and and there were some planes scrambled, and and then what happened? So what, what do we know about that part of the story? Well, we know that uh, Terry Halbardier succeeded in joining that cable and getting the SOS out, which in turn was intercepted by the Israelis, who broke off the attack. Now, meanwhile, uh, the commander of the sixth uh, task force there in the Mediterranean had sent fighter bombers from the USS Saratoga and the USS America to do battle with whoever it was that was attacking <laughs> his naval ship, the USS Liberty. We know furthermore that they were called back on the direct instruction of Secretary of Defense McNamara and the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, we know that from several, several sources. One of them is from Admiral Geis, who was in receipt of these orders and very reluctantly ordered his fighter bombers back. He told one of the Liberty crew who managed to make it to the USS America that he was ordered not to pursue this, to turn them back, because President Johnson did not want to embarrass an ally, Israel. So that's one of the indications here. Uh, the others are, are either in com comment, uh, communications intelligence. You know, the big thing here, uh, Paul, for a uh, intelligence officer is that there are certain species of intelligence after which analysts or journalists actually lust, okay? And those are hard evidence like intercepted communications. And when we have the Israeli pilots as we do, 
saying, that's an American ship. And we have ground control saying, follow your orders, strike it. Well, what further need have we for proof? So number one, what we know is that it was a deliberate attack that was meant to sink everything with no survivors. And number two, we know that it was covered up because everything done in the aftermath of that attack was done to cover it up to include naval officers, naval lawyers who were persuaded to keep their mouths shut under orders because we did not want to embarrass an ally. Now, when Johnson, if this, if this report is correct and Johnson calls back the planes, it must be clear that the mission at that time is to sink the boat. If you're calling back the planes, you're allowing the attack to continue. The attack to continues uh, leads to no survivors. Uh, Joe Tully was skipper of the USS Saratoga. He came to our 25th reunion in Rapid City, South Dakota. And uh, Captain uh, Tully told me personally that uh, there had the aircraft which he had initially launched had some nuclear weapons aboard them. Uh, he had assumed that the reason that they were recalled was because of those nuclear weapons. So he ordered all the nuclear weapons retrieved and rearmed with conventional warfare and relaunched. Admiral Geis notified Washington, and Robert McNamara came back on the line, ordering them return. Admiral Geis said he wanted to hear that from higher authority. Lyndon Johnson himself came on and said, get those aircraft back, I will not have my allies embarrassed. Now, excuse me. The Israelis were using unmarked aircraft. We did not know who was attacking us. Excuse me, unmarked aircraft is a violation of international law. So since the Israelis were using unmarked aircraft, and we did not know who was attacking us, how did Lyndon Johnson know that his allies were attacking us? How did you know they're unmarked? You could see yourself? These, there's no markings on these planes? I did not see them myself, but the other crew members did. From if you, if you try to analyze the Israeli position, whether it starts in error or not, and it, from what you're saying, it seems not very plausible that it's an error, um, then the plan from the very beginning has to be to sink the ship, no survivors. Uh, otherwise, the evidence, there's too many people to say what happened. Uh, then it, what you're suggesting is that at the very least, at some uh, er, fairly early on into this attack, uh, President Johnson decides not to prevent it, not to stop it. Uh, we have one quote about not embarrassing uh, that we don't know any more of the conversation. Uh, Ray and I talked about this interview prior to, the, uh, to this, and we, we just said we're going to be very careful about trying to say what do we have evidence and what does one speculate or theorize about. Um, so we're going to stop this in part one. We're going to do a part two. Um, but Ray, sum up, just to end this, sum up what we know what's evidence. In part two, we'll talk a little bit more about why we think this might have happened and, and, and go a little further into it all. But just sum up, for, for, from your point of view as an, uh, someone who analyzed data for a long time, which, what's the evidence here, quickly? Well, it's very bizarre, uh, Paul, because it admits of no other interpretation than a deliberate Israeli attack on a U.S. naval ship. Uh, with the intent of, of uh, sinking the ship and killing all crew. That's really hard to believe, but the evidence is unassailable. We know that. That's fact. That's not opinion. We also know from confessions by Navy lawyers and by, uh, by all manner of other circumstances that this thing was covered up and still is covered up by the official version. So that we know, cover up and attack, deliberate attack. What we don't know and it boggles the mind. Why did the Israelis do it? And I don't know of any diplomat or U.S. official that has taken the trouble to ask them. Okay, I, I brought that back so, a little bit early so we can get on to the next one. That's shocking enough. But anyway, how much do you think you know about the signing of the Declaration of Independence? Well, we just had the 4th of July. We're supposed to know about that. 
here's the Real News Network one more time, and this time we're going to show you, uh, let's see if I can get this right. There we go. Okay, then we'll be back in about 20 minutes. To mark the adoption of the Declaration of Independence from Great Britain, by the Second Continental Congress in 1776. Now joining us to discuss the radical, little known history of, the, of Independence Day is Peter Leinbaugh. Peter is a historian and author. He just retired from the University of Toledo where he taught for 20 years. He's the author of many books, including The Many-Headed Hydra, Sailors, Slaves, Commoners, and The Hidden History of the Revolutionary Atlantic. He's also the author of The Magna Carta Manifesto, Liberties and Commons for All, as well as most, re most recently, Stop Thief, The Commons, Enclosures, and Resistance. So Peter, um, you know, in popular memory, uh, this day, Independence Day, we remember the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but it was a long process that got the colonists to that point. Talk a little bit about the different uh, political forces, social forces that helped get the U.S., and this was just the, within the first uh, year or two of the, of the Revolutionary War, and, but it had been um, a decade or longer that this conflict had been ongoing between the, the colonies and Great Britain. Talk about how we got to this point. So we're talking about an era before the U.S. has been formed. We're talking about a, uh, a period of historical creation. And it's complex. There are several sides to it. Uh, one side, it's a struggle of freedom against monarchy, this, a struggle of, of uh, the notion of a republic against monarchy. And that is probably the principal theme of the Declaration of Independence. I would suggest you know, that people uh, reread the Declaration of Independence because they'll find uh, 28 reasons for uh, declaring independence from Great Britain. And these reasons reflect a long train of abuses and usurpations uh, or takeovers, to use Thomas Jefferson's language in the Declaration of Independence. And I think uh, one of the most important of these uh, grievances was that the king of England had opposed conditions for new appropriation of land. This is the, the seventh of, of 28 different reasons for declaring independence. And what that meant was that these settlers from Europe wanted to appropriate lands belonging to the Indians, uh, belonging to different Native American peoples. The <clears throat> the Haudenosaunee people, uh, a confederation in New York, uh, the Cherokee people of uh, what's now Tennessee and the Carolinas, uh, the Potawatomi from my part of the country in, um, in Michigan and Ohio. The settlers wanted these lands, but Great Britain, as a result of the Seven Years' War, had said that these lands were off limits to settlement. This was part of the Treaty of Paris of 1763. So here is one of the lesser known um, reasons for declaring independence. That is that the s settlers could not take as much land as they wanted. On that same theme of wars against Native Americans, the 28th reason given is really uh, misleading. Uh, it claims that the King of England, George III, and his ministry and parliament had, uh, had caused the inhabitants of, quote, our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an unextinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So this was like uh, Jessel, I, I liken it to a jihad, or I liken it to a uh, crusade, because this is precisely what Thomas Jefferson claims of the Native Americans 
is actually what will happen to them as a result of the Declaration of Independence. That is that the wars against Great Britain led to a merciless destruction you, uh, in New York, particularly of Sullivan's raid of 1779 of the orchards, the cornfields, the senior citizens, the men and the women of the Odin of the Haudenosaunee people of the Confederation in in New York. And, and Peter, and it's, it's worth mentioning that the British weren't necessarily against expanding um, and taking more of the natives' land. It was just getting too expensive for them. Uh, they were they had um, you know spent enormous amount of money fighting the French and fighting the French in the French and Indian War, and as well as um, and so they had been taxing the colonists, which had you know caused a great protest. Um, yes, good, very good point. Very good. They wanted the the settlers, the settler colonists, to pay for those wars against the against France, quite right. And and that's where the famous uh, phrase, uh, uh, no taxation without representation comes in. And it's, um, I think it's the 17th reason given in the Declaration of Independence for for severing the connection with, uh, with Great Britain. Uh, that, and also, the 19th reason, I'll quote that, is for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. And that I pause there for a minute to let the words sink in, because what will come to mind to those who've been following subsequent U.S. history is the practice by the CIA to render suspect terrorist suspects and have them tried overseas where torture is a form of of investigation in in secret courts in egypt in poland and in other countries we don't know about this process is called rendition but i was amazed you know in the early part of this millennium you know after the invasion of iraq and when this kind of torturing began that it, that it was explicitly given as a reason for independence back in 1776. That is, transporting people beyond the seas to be tried for pretended offenses in foreign courts. Um, so I, excuse me, Jessel, for jumping you know, right into the Iraq wars, but um, the Declaration of Independence, if it's going to live at all, um, in current realities, you know, we must, we go back and forth between our present and our past. And, uh, and Peter, and so I wanted, we, we were going to talk about um, a whole range of issues, but, you know, in your book, Many Headed Hydra, you talk about the little known role that commoners and uh, even slaves played in, in fomenting the American Revolution. Can you give us a little bit of that history? I can give you a little bit of it. Um, the Dunmore's Pop proclamation in Virginia promised freedom to slaves. Dunmore was a British general. So the slave, like the Indian, was caught between a rock and a hard place. That is, whether to join the colonists in their bid for independence or whether to join the British, who promised immediate emancipation. But slave revolts preceding uh, the War of Independence, like the Indian revolts, like the Great Revolt of Pontiac in 1763, or the revolts against impressment that took place up and down the coast of the colonies. All of these here, you know, I gesture to Indians, to African Americans, and to European sailors and workers. Um, I call them, we call them commoners because so many of them, before they came to the colonies under f terms of coerced labor, so many of them had participated in, in economies which were not based on private property or incessant accumulation and, and aggression for land belonging or used by others. And these forms of other forms of economies 
um, especially in England, were called commons. Uh, they were common lands. And when those lands were enclosed or fenced off, the people who formerly had subsisted on them now were um, had few choices in life. And even if they weren't enslaved as or coerced as teenagers in West Africa or as um, as as commoners in England who were impressed. Uh, they began in the United States, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, they began to get to know each other. They began, and they did so in taverns. They did so in poor parts of the town. And they did so, above all, on ships. So the ship itself uh, was a machine. We usually see it as a machine of commerce or a machine of war, but it was also a machine where the people of the world first got to know each other. They first got to hear one another's stories. And in some ways you can say, this is where multicultural America began to be formed. And, uh, and so Peter, um, you, you call that the Motley crew because it's a multi-ethnic crew and the, the population may, oh, not, not even a crew, not just a crew, but also uh, bands of people that worked on land as well. And you know, they, they were multi-ethnic, and you know they, their relationships might have crossed uh, class lines as well. Yes, this is this is quite true. You know, Herman Melville was the man who had the imagination to see this um, in all his great nautical books, whether Billy Budd or Typh Poo or White Jacket, and then of course Moby Dick. But that that reality of democracy on shipboard. And as you say, um, multi-ethnic uh, communication was a big part of the background to the um, American Revolution. It was a bit, even though those people did not lead the revolution in the sense of signing their names to documents, they led the they they led the freedom from actual slavery. They led the freedom from actual and coerced labor on ships. And they also led uh, in Philadelphia here, I'm thinking, Jessel, um, they led the struggle for fair prices and they led the struggle against debt. And these are two issues that, that remain with us. So this motley crew will provide the, uh, the force of the revolutionary armies. And when they're not paid or when they're mistreated, they are perfectly capable of mutiny. And Peter, um, you, you mentioned one of the slogans of the revolution, no taxation on representation. But as we, as we touched upon in this conversation already, there were many groups that were not franchised at the culmination of the revolution. Obviously, African Americans, women, and men that were not, that didn't own land. Um, and you know, it's often portrayed as the elites created this framework, this, you know, that created the Constitution that would in, like, in eventually grant these um, rights and, and, you know, the right to vote and other civil rights to, to the entire population. But talk about the, the revolutionary process that actually led to those rights being achieved. Okay, that's a, um, Jessel, that's a process of American history. That's a process of struggle. That's a I hesitate to say class struggle, um, though it is a class struggle of slaves, it's a struggle of poor people, it's a struggle of weavers and spinners, it's a struggle of housewives, it's a struggle of women more generally, it's a struggle um, that is not over. And the, sometimes the, the American Civil War is seen as a, a continuation, as the chapter two where the Declaration of Independence and 4th of July was chapter one. Uh, th this is why the 4th of July, you know, has this military flavor to it. You know, and we all turn out and we, we watch the fireworks. But the first fireworks, of course, were, as we know from the song, the rocket's red glare. Uh, this came from a war. Uh, speaking to you in Baltimore, I don't need to remind you that uh, Fort McHenry in Baltimore is where the British uh, invaded in 1812. Uh, 
So I'm, what I'm trying to say is that war is the most extreme form of struggle, on a large scale anyway. And those powers and rights and freedoms that you referred to and that we celebrate on the 4th of July, they are the product of vast human struggle. I mean, the struggle for American independence was not just that war, but was a but goes back to the 17th century. The struggle against slavery was at least 100 years old. Um, you know, if you take 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation, 100 years earlier was 1763. That's the plantation of George Washington. 100 years before that, 1673, you also have slavery. So the struggle against slavery is a very old and long struggle and reaches a great, great culmination in the uh, war between the states, but in the Civil War. And, and, and may I quote, Jessel, from Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist? Yes, absolutely. Okay, because he says something that, that I'm thinking about, and I wonder whether you all are thinking about it too. This is the speech he gave on the 4th of July. And I think a lot of you are familiar with that speech where he says, what is the meaning of the 4th of July to the slave? But before he says that, he says what it is that we need. And this now is just a few years before John Brown's raid. It's a few years before Fort Sumter and the beginning of the Civil War. Here, in the words of Frederick Douglass, is what we need. It's not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Isn't that powerful? Here, here he's using the rhetoric from the era of the Declaration of Independence, and he's prophesizing. He's, it's a prophetic voice from the Old Testament, imagining the war to come, the American Civil War, that at last put an end. Well, not quite. It didn't quite end uh, slavery, did it? Uh, because the 13th Amendment permits slavery or involuntary servitude in cases of prison. And so I think it's, you know, if we're going to jump from the past to the present continuously, then we need to say that is not yet finished as the prison population of the U.S. continues to grow and to grow. Peter Leinbaugh, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Okay, so we're going to we're going to jump right away to the uh, the next one. Mumia Abu Jamal really got a bad deal, and uh, this will kind of sum it up. He was one of my heroes. We're going to go straight to that. So here we go. What's up, world, and welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like here at the Real News Network. I'm Jared Ball here in Baltimore. For more than 30 years, supporter of the MOVE movement, former Black Panther Party member, and still practicing broadcast journalist Mumia Abu-Jamal has been incarcerated. Despite his imprisonment and recent struggles over institutional abuse and denial of adequate health services leading to his deteriorating physical condition, Abu Jamal continues to be among the most vigilant and productive voices exposing injustices the world over. And now he has a new book just published on City Lights Press called Writing on the Wall, Selected Prison Writings of Mumia Abu Jamal. Joining us now to talk about the book and update us on Mumia's condition is Dr. Johanna Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez is a professor in the Department of Black and Latino Studies at Baruch College in New York, from where she now joins us. Welcome, Dr. Fernandez, to the program. Thanks for joining us. 
Thank you so very much for having me on the show, Jared. So one, I just want to thank you publicly uh, for the continuing good work you've done in maintaining a relationship with Mumia and making sure the rest of the world uh, continues to know about his work and his struggle. So I just wanted to thank you for that uh, very publicly uh, uh, as we get started and uh, then ask you if you would just update us on first his physical condition and then let's talk about the new book that you uh, edited. Well, Mumia's condition remains uh, quite dire. I visited him approximately two weeks ago, uh, as, and his skin condition um, is of special concern. His skin uh, is completely blackened. It remains itchy. Um, it, he looks like he's got alligator skin, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, he has open wounds in his legs. His feet were very swollen. And uh, the demand of the movement is that he be allowed um, to have his own doctors review his case. Um, he still has a problem with diabetes. Uh, we're talking about a, a whole host of problems that he's experiencing, but that other prisoners experience daily across the country. And part of what we have to say is that we live in a system um, that is barbaric because it is willing to kill prisoners through medical neglect. So we're asking uh, supporters to continue to muckrake, to continue to be vigilant on this issue, but also to call the Department of Corrections of Pennsylvania uh, and the prison. And I have those numbers to share with you at the end of the program. Okay, great. Uh, and we'll also encourage people to check out his continued uh, work, his commentaries at prisonradio.org, and to see the documentary Long Distance Revolutionary for more on the background on, 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 of his case. Um, and his work as a journalist. Uh, and it is the, the subject of that work, uh, I believe is, uh, the, rather the subject of that work is, I believe, the subject of this, uh, of your new book, uh, um, Writing on the Wall. And we've, we've known over the years that Mumia, again, has continued to publish books and, and uh, radio commentaries, and to also have those commentaries censored, whether it be from National Public Radio uh, or other venues as well, uh, he still struggles to, to have that work uh, reach the mass audience it deserves, despite having such a broad audience and, and uh, network of followers and supporters all around the world. What is it that's new in this book? I understand that there's some unpublished material and some fresh things that he's been writing. Uh, tell us what we can find and expect in this, this latest volume. Well, this is a collection of approximately 100 of Mumia's radio commentaries. They're eloquent, uh, they're incisive, and they're about the crisis in American society and in the world in the post-civil rights and black power movement era. Uh, these are his earliest writings beginning with those he wrote immediately after his incarceration in 1982. Uh, and the first of these uh, writings is important because in this, um, in this commentary, Mumia declares his innocence and talks about his own case. This is the Christmas in a cage? This is the Christmas in a cage. Uh, and this is important because, as you know, Mumia has dedicated his entire life to writing not about his case, but about the crisis of mass incarceration, the problems of war, uh, the problems of, of U.S. empire, and the crisis of capitalism. So we see in the first uh, of, of these commentaries uh, a rare example of, of Mumia talking about himself, his case, and what happened on the night um, that Officer Daniel Faulkner was killed, um, which led to his incarceration. The first nine uh, essays are unpublished. They appeared initially in a pamphlet produced by the movement in the late 1980s titled uh, Survival is Still a Crime. And this volume is essentially um, a black radical counter-narrative 
to the ruling ideology um, of the last 40 years. He offers a radical counter narrative to what we hear about the absence of racism uh, in society following uh, the civil rights movement. He offers a counter narrative uh, to American empire and the war on terror. And he really exposes the bankruptcy of capitalism. Uh, we're going to read about um, the emergence of Reaganism, the role of Obama in contemporary American society. There are essays about Katrina, uh, incredible essay on Ferguson. We read about Haiti, about Palestine. So really, this is... Um, an introduction to Mumia's writings and a rich um, syllabus for those black and brown uh, activists who are coming of age politically today to understand the world in which they live, but to also imagine not just a fight against the society in which we live in, but a struggle for a completely new society. Absolutely. Well, Professor Fernandez, we thank you very much for joining us. Let's go ahead and have you uh, give out those phone numbers. Uh, and while you're pulling those up, I just want to say very quickly that I want to encourage everybody who sees this to uh, be in touch with Mumia and other political prisoners. Uh, Mumia has been gracious and always responding uh, the, the, the few times, unfortunately, the too few on my account uh, that, that I've written. Uh, he's been gracious in response. He was the first to respond with his essay to our volume, Critical of Manning Marable's Malcolm X. And uh, uh, I mean, he stays in touch. I mean, so we, I would encourage people to not only make the, the, the phone calls you're suggesting or requesting, uh, but also be in touch with me and let people know and let him know that people uh, still remember him and are appreciative of his work. But Professor Fernandez, before we go, please uh, do give out those numbers. So those numbers are um, the number to the Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania and to the head um, of that uh, department is John Wetzel. That's the head of the Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania, and his number is 717-728-4109. Once again, that's 717-728-4109. And then the superintendent at SEI Mahanoy, the prison where he's housed, um, his name is John Karestes, K E R. E S T E S, and that number is 570 773 2158. Once